grandmama used to pray, oh Lord, please save them from the evil snares and all the dangers that entangle. Yeah, though they walking through the valley of the shadows, just prepare and make them fit for every battle because, right, I know they bound to come and I know they bound to fall, but in your bounty, Lord, preserve their beautiful home. Right, we still survive and offer grandma's prayers, surrounded by the jungle and the lion's den. Tread light, cause these traps is inconspicuous, they hide right in plain sight, thinking we don't see them when they linger, look right beneath the surface, then leave a trail of corpses, crisis, prices, your life a disposable commodity, like living in a fantasy, conditioned to believe that the system even cares whether selling CDs or walking or driving or reading, look, they don't even need a reason, it's just your breathing and being black. And it's such a pretty fall, a pretty fall It don't seem like we falling at all, at all It's just a GMO dream Where things are never really what they seem Please, kill the violins Tell them just to play me something pretty Cause this pretty city got me screaming Bloody murder So they got me screaming This pretty city got me Got me on song, look, get your hand up on my pocket, distraction, so lazy they use the same tactics, like condom with some trinkets, just don't let them get to thinking, that light bulb gets a blinking, you know niggas and ideas, oh dear, my dear, my dear, you may not know me, but I know you very well, for sight, for sight, they say hindsight is 2020, well tell me something, we gotta see that history is on repeat, and maybe it takes a beat and a melody to speak a little louder than the message in the clouds, or the essence in the air i swear my god is just so clear that a system driven by fear can never give us nothing but more of the same things things oh when it's such a pretty fall a pretty fall it don't seem like we've fallen at all it's just a gmo dream where things are never really what they seem please cue the violins tell them just to play me something pretty because this gritty city got me screaming it's murder Got me screaming, got me This gritty city got me, got me on song What's happening good people? Welcome to another edition of RSTV on Black Power Media Yes indeed, it's been a while It's been a while, we are grateful, we're grateful to be here It is now March we are three months into 2024, and it's a very, very, very promising year. We call this year the year of the Siafu, the year of the Siafu. We are coming. The ants are here. We are here. The People's Army, we are here. That's what it's all about. It's about political education. It's about clarity. It's about understanding and it's about victory on all fronts. It's about African liberation, victory for African and colonized oppressed people around the planet. Imperialism shall fall. Capitalism shall be crushed to dust. And all those who aid in that life force, they have to choose a side. Anyway, this is Zars TV. Today we have a very powerful episode. I stopped counting years ago. I don't know how many episodes we've done. Doesn't really matter as long as we know that we are here. Today we're talking about contextualizing Angela Davis, the agency and identity of an icon. A book by Dr. Joy James. So if we're going to talk about Dr. Joy James's book, then we ought to invite Dr. James to join us. So let me see if I can get Dr. James on deck. What's happening, Dr. James? How you doing? I'm doing well. I see that you're you're out in the universe with planets flowing yes. around you. So that's always a good sign. Yes, gotta gotta keep the planets revolving. You know, it's it's a um, serious thing these days. You know. So sometimes you got to step back and look at the world from mm. a whole nother plane and in a whole nother existence. Um, that's what it's about when we talk about revolution. Um, definitely glad to have you on. I think the last time we were on together, you were on this side of the fence being an interviewer. Um, 
and when we had uh, some of Mumia's good people on. So for folks who missed that episode, make sure you go back and check the Guerrilla Intellectual University episode of Mumia Abu Jamal, uh, the assassination attempts on Mumia Abu Jamal, which we had uh, Pam Africa, Noel Hanrahan, and Dr. Ricardo Alvarez, and Dr. Joy James and I have ran chat going on that. We were rolling. Uh-huh. In the San Francisco Bay um, publication, they were kind enough to take an excerpt, um, more than kindness, right? They're organizers and they're committed. So they were able to focus on Pam Africa, Ricardo Alvarez, Noel Hanaran, and to deal with the, and I think you helped craft the concept or at least the language about it, the attempted assassinations against Mumia Abu Jamal. So people should check that out as well. Is it San Francisco Bay Review? Is that yes, the- San Francisco Bayview. Shout out to um mm-hmm. our good friend uh Mary over there, San Francisco San Francisco Bayview. Um and I've been worked with them probably about two decades ago. Uh we used to I used to cover Black August for the San Francisco Bayview. But shout out to uh Mary and all the good folks over there for finding our work useful and turn it into print. So yeah, that was dope. It was great. So today we have this wonderful piece right here, contextualizing Angela Davis. Dr. James, you've written like three books in the past year. It's like you're just putting books out like I'm putting episodes out. What's going on? Let's let's talk about that. I mean, you had um I Pearl. Well, give, give us the correct title of that because I will jack it up. And then so the acronym, you got that, In Pursuit yeah. of Revolutionary Love. And that is the collective book I've said, you know, elsewhere. I tried to get all the names of the people who contributed on that book. It, it didn't work out for the publisher. But yes, uh, Deshaun Harrison did the foreword and Mumia Abu-Jamal wrote the afterword, which, you know, both of them brilliant but Mumia's very poignant um, analysis and also the focus on love and struggle are very clear in his writing. So I was grateful to both of them and all the contributors within the book. I think there's like 17 or 18 chapters. Definitely, definitely. The second book, because you have a book that, that we didn't even finished reading before you dropped the third one. It's like, we're still working on the second one. And here you come with another book. I mean, you just, I mean, I don't even see how you're doing it. You just like, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, it's when it's like, get a life and then you can stop writing. Um, New Bones Abolition, Captive Maternal Agency, and the Afterlife of Erica Garner is the second book. So the subtitle, Captive Maternal, which I've been talking about for a while, I think I was on your program, a co- yeah, a co- last year, 23 or 22. 2022. Yes. Yeah, and also other folks in BPM, right? Um, talking about the captive maternal, the concept of it. Uh, but really, this is a tribute to Erica Garner, the oldest child of Eric Garner, who was killed in 2014 by the NYPD through chest compression and chokehold, and how she fought for the it's more than the, I, the word legacy comes in, but the legacy of struggle. She fought for that in order to be able to hold the NYPD and the city and the state and the nation accountable, not only to her father's death, but 2014 was also the year that Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson and Tamir Rice, the 12 year old, was killed in Ohio. And of course there were deaths that preceded and deaths that followed. So her organizing was amazing. She transitioned in December, 2017, four months after she gave birth to her second child, who she named after her father. And this was a tribute, but it also talks a lot about black feminism, our contradictions, our contributions, compradors and struggle. Both for two excellent books. I was joking, I have had the opportunity to read uh, both of them. And I think that uh, it's a must have, especially oftentimes, you know, the name Erica Garner is is absent when you talk about um, raw, gritty, 
um, activists. And I think that we say that people get involved through activism um, or through movement work through one of three ways, and that would be inspiration, aspiration, or desperation. Um, and I would think that Erica was inspired by the strangling of her father, Eric Garner, and she took it to the streets. And at first, like so many, quote unquote, um, uh, victims, family members, oftentimes they are, you know, misled in the beginning into thinking that, you know, everyone that's out here saying that, you know, we want freedom or justice, so on and so forth is on the same page. But unfortunately, they uh, quickly realize that there are parasites that sometimes need hosts. So she did what she had to do and got out there and um, took it up a notch. So may she continue to rise in power and, um, you know, yeah, make sure you get those books. Yeah. And I would just add to that. Um, there's, it's not a biography of her, but it really analyzes some of the contradictions I think that you just put out there um, and the complications about moving forward as we do through stages towards war resistance. This is when I think about stages of the captive maternal, but I did want to add that all proceeds from New Bones Abolition go to prison radio, which is also a strong supporter of obviously the incarcerated and as well Mumia Abu-Jamal, who you know is facing quite a number of um, serious illnesses or medical neglect, attempted assassinations. That was the title we used before. But um, yeah, it's like a, it's holistic circle. Like in different ways, all of our struggles, when we are ethical and we're devoted, they touch each other and they align and they converge. So it may look like we ha always have too much on our plate, but we always have enough, you know, stamina and enough care to deal with what's on the table. Out of doubt. Definitely, um, you know, I agree with you 100%. I don't think, uh, I think the folks always, you know, counting what's on everyone else's plate. You know, and like, well, how are you going to do this? And how are you going to do that? Well, if you mess around and help me with this plate, then it won't even be it. Yeah. Won't even be as heavy. You know what I mean? We can all get full. Um, I want to talk about contextualizing Angela Davis because I think this is, um, you know, it's it's a a powerful piece. One, um, it came out on uh, Blues, Bloomsbury Press out of the UK, I believe. Right. And under the philosophy series, I think it first came out in the UK, United Kingdom in January, and then it was just released in uh, the United States in February. So I guess you got one of the first copies. Of course, um, I'm, I'm one of your writing partners. Why wouldn't I? Duh. Oh, duh. Sorry. Duh. I forgot. No, but and, and, and I, I'm definitely grateful for, uh, for it. Um, for folks who are uh, you know, who this is their first time hearing this title and, and haven't heard anything about it. They might have just bumped into this platform or bumped into this show, didn't even know it existed. The title, Contextualizing Angela Davis, The Agency and Identity of an Icon. Can you give us a breakdown of what that means and, and why this book is important? Yeah, so I can say why it's important to me. I, I, the readers uh, or non-readers, I guess people sometimes just hear the title of a book and they don't read it and they simply know what it is about. But it's it's relevant to our struggles today, even though it has a specific time period. And so for me, contextualization or having a context allows us to understand what we're dealing with in terms of our struggle, what we're dealing with in terms of our fear, what we're dealing with in terms of our aspiration and as well our courage, right? And the book begins around 1944 when, you know, that's the year that Davis is born in, in Alabama. And it ends 1970, right before, even though there's a reference to this, but right before August 7, 1970, when Jonathan Jackson, the 17-year-old brother of George Jackson, who has access to Davis's 
weapons, registered guns, you know, because they're stored in a communal house. And I believe he also functioned in some ways as not just a protester and supporter, because Davis was a supporter of the Soledad brothers, which would include George Jackson, but he also likely functioned in some ways as a bodyguard. So when he took the weapons, and you and I, we wrote about that, right? When we wrote the piece on Rochelle McGee for Inquest that came out in 2023. This is this becomes the moment, I think, the catalyst in which, you know, when Davis goes underground, when they become a fugitive, when they're captured, when they're incarcerated, when they're placed in jail, when they have this, you know, trial, when they're exonerated in 1972, when they go to Cuba and they go to Toni Morrison's house to write their autobiography, which becomes a bestseller. But it's a 17-year-old, right, who who creates this catalyst of agency, but also trauma, right? That creates eventually an icon. So when I say the identity, you know, an agency of an icon, I'm talking not so much about an individual person, right? Because, you know, it is not, again, a biography, just like when I wrote the, the you know, New Bones Abolition, it was not a biography around Erica Garner, I am not a biographer. I'm a political theorist, political philosopher, analyst. It was really trying to understand how we create icons, but how they come, you know, originally from settings that are very similar, depending on our class standing, right? Very familiar and very similar to many other people but it usually, in my mind, there's one act or deed that creates this sort of unique persona. And even though I stop at 1970, right before John does that very heroic deed, trying to save the life of his brother and other incarcerated Black people, for some reason, uh, multiple reasons, uh, Aaron Bushnell's name you know, who immolated himself um, recently to protest and resist genocide. But the youth, right, do, do, do these very risky endeavors in what is seen as a war zone. Now, I'm not saying it was a war zone for Davis, but it was a war zone for George Jackson and for John Jackson. And Davis had adjacency and proximity to both of them. But the book itself does not dwell on that. It actually starts with how this particular young person whose mother turns out to be um, aligned or a member of the Communist Party, so the whole phrase, red diaper babies, and her two daughters, Angela Davis and her younger sister, Fania Davis, um, become integrationists into elite schools, become ethical people, become academics in different ways, become scholars. And so the context though of making that meaningful, right? That means a deep dive into that era from 44 to 1970 and attention to the Cold War and all the negotiations, all the back and forth that would allow Davis to become that iconic persona, where all other people who were directly involved in revolutionary struggles would perhaps fade or somehow merge and become adjacent to her. Hmm. Now, that that is uh, it's, it's a few different things there. So I, I'm going to start um, a couple of things. One, uh, in the introduction of the book, um, you mentioned you said Time and other mainstream sectors celebrate the 21st century Angela Davis, who was aligned with progressivism. Um, in, a, in the 20th century, during the Cold War, corporate media were wary, wary of a leading member of the Communist Party, CPUSA, who was also an important ally to Black radicals and Black Panther Party. You just mentioned, you said, um, to a great extent, you talked about how others would have faded away. Mm -hmm. um, why is it that you think that um, Angela Davis was able to, you know, through adjacency, as I believe you said, why do you think that she was able to survive and go beyond being this 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 fugitive to this cultural icon that is accepted um, even by 
the state for all practical purposes. You know, how, how does that happen? And I'm, we're going to bounce a little bit back and forth for you on my, you know, because I can sure. kind of... No, I mean, it's, it's a complicated book. I think that in notes are like 30 pages plus, but there's... It's, it's broken into three parts. One is in socialization and education. So obviously she's growing up around the time of Brown versus Board of Education. And there are different ways. I guess one way we could frame this is what is the relationship of the Black elite to the Black working class and the Black incarcerated who are rebels? So those are like three different pods, right? the black elite or black bourgeoisie or black petty bourgeoisie, right? The second grouping would be um, the working class or the laborers, impoverished laborers, right? And the third category would be the rebels. So I don't, I don't want to keep using the term iconic because sometimes it just, it's an empty container and it sounds like promotional material. But we can say that George Jackson, Jonathan Jackson, the Soledad brothers, that there were struggles inside of prisons then, just as there were strikes and um, hunger strikes as well, labor strikes, political prisoners still held now in the 21st century, who became the motivation or the embodiment or the motivation to rebel against the state. Now, when we think of somebody like me as an academic in those three pods, I would be situated into the integrationist, seeking education, middle-class stability, and wanting to be helpful and adjacent to the other two sectors, the sectors of laborers and workers and the sectors of the politicized rebels, right? So when you look at this text, when you read through it. Yes, it does. In fact, there's a preface that it starts with when I say how I first met Davis, because the Communist Party USA is central in that connection, because that's how I met Davis, right? And I talk a bit in the preface about meeting Davis first in Manhattan, and then later in Nairobi, working with Davis with, you know, international people who are identified as being aligned with the Soviet bloc and the liberation movements from the so-called third world or global south, right? And then I move on to say, you know, seeing Davis in Moscow, understanding that in the late 1980s, the Soviet Union under Mikhail Gorbachev, the Soviet Union is gonna fall. Ronald Reagan, like Gorbachev tear down that wall. And what happens is that you see the disillusion or the yeah, disillusion is a real one. The dis the uh, how does it say that word? The the eradication or you always use what you see is beginning to dissolve is the so-called you know second world. So there's three worlds. You know the first world is Western European powers, North America, Canada, U.S. This is the imperial bloc. The second world would be the Soviet world by right, Eastern Europe. The third world would be the liberation zones in Africa and the Caribbean and Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, right? These former colonies that are seeking to be free. To understand Davis's iconic stature, how she became a global name, to understand in some ways how Davis did, you know, painful, Lee, you know, was held in jail for 17 months, and jail is different from prison, but would be exonerated in 1972. And in our article, we also say that Rochelle McGee was exonerated of the same crimes, basically, that Davis was accused of a year later in 1973. But he's held in prison for 50 years more because the judge won't enter the jury verdict into the court records. But Davis had the backing of influential people, so the judge was going to have to enter those records, and then she was going to be acquitted. So again, there are three worlds, like before the collapse in the late 1980s, and Davis is a beneficiary of the fact 
that these three worlds coexist, that the Soviet Union has some influence on the U.S. So the USSR can, you know, put out the uh, sort of narrative, which is accurate, that Davis should not have been arrested, that Davis is a political prisoner, and that the U.S., right, under Richard Nixon, President Richard Nixon at the time, that the U.S. would respond by saying, um, we're really a democracy too, we can have fair trials. At the same time, there are two other people on trial at the same time that Davis is on trial, right? I already mentioned Rochelle McGee. The other one would be Elmer Geronimo Pratt from you know the Southern California Panthers and also probably the Black Liberation Army. So Davis is special in part because there was a global campaign but the global campaign, quite a bit of it came not just from Black people who were concerned and outraged that she was arrested in the first place, but the global campaign was also linked to the Soviet Union. And so you're talking about global politics emerging around a 20-something-year-old Black woman who's getting her doctorate in philosophy. That's an anomaly in itself. From Birmingham, a 20-year-old Black woman from Birmingham. She's from Birmingham, but you know, as you know, if we went through the book, I mean, she leaves at age 15. This is the out migration. So you right. think of people integrating after, you know, Brown versus Board, you know, the Supreme Court um, case, right? Which says there has to be integration. Well, there's some people who integrated Southern schools, and we talked about that Jim Crow era schools, right? There are other people with means, like her Her family was middle class. That's why I said there are three pots, right? She's not working class. She's not from the laboring class. And she's not from the revolutionary incarcerated rebel on the ground or in the prison class. So it's the ethical middle class. Her mother has a graduate degree from NYU. Her father has a degree. They're both were school teachers, but then her father opened a small business. And so... There's an outmigration of middle class black children in Birmingham as teens, and they're integrating by going north. It's like we're not going to have like our kids like tripped over broken glass or beaten up at school or have people spit on them and call them the N word. We're just going to send them to New York, Massachusetts and New Jersey to go to private schools. This becomes another form of socialization. It also becomes a zone of access to affluent white liberals who run those zones, right? So for me, the puzzle would be, how do you merge those three together? Because the iconic persona is tied to all three zones. But the one zone that we're most familiar with, the one zone that we're occupied in the most is the zone of the middle class or the aspiring black middle class that it's aligned to education. So education is your future. Nobody's telling them at that age in Birmingham with parents who have degrees that your future is to be a revolutionary or rebel. The reason we're sending you to Manhattan to Elizabeth Irwin School, which is a private um, white school in the village, which radical leftist white intellectuals who are dealing with the McCarthy era is like, we're just going to create a private school for our children. Well, that means they had the wealth, they had the access, they can hire the teachers, they could fund, you know, the whole infrastructure. And so she integrates into that zone. She's staying with a family that are principled and also interact with the Soviets because they're looking for a detente or, you know, cease ending war, like the whole demands were you know, we're making or trying to make right now to an administration that's not listening about, you know, ceasefire. We don't need to have these global wars always going on. But the home that she's staying with, right, is from, you know, white academics, intellectuals who attend Harvard. So again, when our uplift is within the zone of elites, white elites, then we're also learning, we're also being socialized, like definitely the family socializer when in Birmingham, or they would call it Bombingham, because white supremacists 
when there's integration and black families with means. Again, this is not poor black families. When she's age four, their their parents are you know buying a very nice house, which they'll probably have rental to help cover mortgage and costs. But it's, it's I believe it's a Victorian, and so black people are integrating into not just the schools by sending their children north. Before that even happens, they're integrating to white neighborhoods. So she is familiar with self-defense through her father and through the other fathers because they patrol the neighborhood with guns because they called it bombing him because white terrorists were setting bombs to blow up houses that black people were buying. But there's, there's a linkage, right? And this goes across ideology. She's there. There's another person that, um, Habrowski, that I mentioned, who his parents will send him to Massachusetts, and Condoleezza Rice is there. So he, there's a whole span of ideologies, from Davis being the most radical because she'll join the Communist Party USA, to Habrowski being sort of a liberal Democrat, I'm assuming, to Condoleezza Rice, who's going to work for the Bush administration and also, you know, decades later have false narratives of weapons of mass destruction that lead to hundreds of thousands of deaths in Iraq. So what is the context here? I mean, I'm taking a while to set it up. The international context is that there is a Cold War and the U.S. can't seem to be racially barbaric with Black people because it's not a good look because there is an alternative to the US, which would be the Soviet Union, which is training engineers and teachers and doctors supporting Cuba. It's an alternative world. It's not perfect, but it's alternative to the hyper capitalist imperial formation that the US became after World War II, right? So that is one context. The other context is of a very intimate loving family which understands that if their children are going to advance, they're going to have to leave Black people, which is essentially what happens, right? Like, we're going to get you that scholarship to go hang out with white people, the white private high school, and then you'll go to Brandeis, which is formed, you know, she's older than the, the university, Brandeis University, because it's formed after the 1940s, right? Or in the 1940s, following... Um, the Nazi Holocaust against Jews, right? So you'll do your undergrad there, then you'll go to Germany and you'll study at the Frankfurt School, and then you'll end up in California and that's where she'll meet the Panthers. But these are zones that are connected to black struggle, but do you also see how they're isolated? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you're isolated, so for me, this is a 21st century question, which I, I'm trying not to impose on the text, but it's a query I have to raise. If we're consistently isolated from not just the working class and the poor who are black, but also from the, the black rebels and the black revolutionaries, because we wanna help and be supportive and be on their defense committees, but we didn't say we were gonna roll like them or be adjacent to them not adjacent like link, but adjacent to them in the physical struggle, right? And so may I say it's contextualizing, but I, what I'm trying to explain, there's more than one context, but you have to deal with the Cold War. Let me give you the example and I'll stop. Richard Nixon as president first starts off saying she's guilty, like she was part of that mission to free, you know, black prisoners, but be mindful. My understanding based on the data is everybody died from the prison guard shooting into a van that was either still or idling, you know, in a, in the parking lot, which means you could have saved the life of the white judge, Harold Haley, who was, that was the person they were most concerned about, but you also could have saved the life of the 17 year old 10 teen, sorry. And the other two black, um, incarcerated men who were, you know, testifying in a trial who were there and Rochelle McGee survived, but he was shot up. So when Richard Nixon is coming out in the public and saying she is guilty, he's going to walk that back because there's a Soviet Union backing her. 
it's not just that we were backing her. It's like the globe was backing her in terms of European socialists or European, you know, communists. And the CPUSA has a very close relationship. Communist Party USA has a very close relationship to the Communist Party Soviet Union, CPSU. So it becomes a global struggle over whether or not the state can execute her or disappear her in life in prison. And so Nixon's narrative starts to change and he starts to invite Soviet physicists, atomic physicists to come in and have a front row and look at the trial to make sure she gets a fair trial. There's no other political prisoner who was offered that. Like, we'll go to another country and we'll invite their scientists, like, here's a front row and see if we're doing a good job at this. You know, that's not an option unless it's created, unless it's a forced creation. Why, why, why would they create that? I mean, I, I'm just, I mean, I know you, you mentioned. Because, the whole yeah. World. You know, I, I didn't talk to Nixon, so I don't know exactly what he was doing, but I. Yeah, I was checking. Assume, you might have knew him. I don't know. I'm, Go just, ahead. I'm assuming, right, that once, how to say this? I mean, I try to lay it out carefully in the book. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to like sell it, but I'm telling you, get it out of the library if you don't want to buy it just so you can comprehend because it took a long time to write this right and there were a lot of like don't do this book you're going to have trouble you know if you do this book etc etc but my understanding of the cold war at the time there was a number of things going on nixon wanted to get into china he wanted to you know expand um economic relationships right but they also if you go back to the 1951 we charge genocide document by the Civil Rights Congress. So that was a black unit inside the CPUSA again, right? So Paul Robeson brought it to the United Nations and basically it was about lynchings, dishonor, theft of land. It it was about occupation and apartheid, right? That was a bad look for the United States across the world because that document circulated around the globe. The US presents itself even though this is not how it's functioned, but its prestige is based on its democracy. So it claims to have a state edifice that allows everyone to participate and that it does not have predatory policing and that the CIA don't assassinate people. I mean, it's a narrative that they sell for legitimacy to maintain the empire because you have to have PR. So when Nixon realized he was going to need good PR around Davis because her defense committees had made her so famous across the globe. And so like, if you go to France or if you went to Britain, it's like, what's going on with Angela Davis? If you go to Italy, what's going on with Angela Davis? The middle class, I'm going back to the middle class. The middle class has a clout that laborers, the unhoused, you know, the unemployed, don't wield that kind of clout or power within what is supposed to be a sophisticated democracy. Once you get the middle class asking about, is this going to be a fair trial? And it becomes a global query. Then your, your PR machine is going to kick in. Nobody, how to say this, you can keep someone like Rochelle McGee in for 50 years. And maybe some people care and try to get him out. And maybe some people say things uh, that we want to get him out, but we don't have a plan. But no, when it came to Davis, there was a plan. There were six, at least six, private attorneys. Their JDs, their degrees were from Yale, Harvard, UC Berkeley. There was Gloria Steinem, who had worked for the CIA, was the head of the fundraising committee. And that wasn't Davis's decision. That would have been the decision of the CPUSA. And so it's strategic maneuvering. Getting Davis out was not about the right to rebel. Getting Davis out was about the fact that she did not rebel, that a 17-year-old took her weapons without her permission. And that's why she deserved exoneration. But we know a lot of people deserve exoneration and they don't get it. 
again, because they're not a global brand. By the time, you know, she did heroic things, right? When she declared that she was a communist, um, a member of the Communist Party, when she um, became the first black philosophy professor and instructor to teach in the University of California. So this is at UCLA. And she, you said, yes, I am a member. That was very heroic. And then, you know, Ronald Reagan, then the governor, later would be president of the United States, attempted to, you know, fire her. So there's things that she's done, you know, supporting the Soledad brothers. That's all important. But what I'm saying, if you look at contacts, that is not the heartbeat of a revolutionary struggle. That is supporting or becoming an advocate for the people who are the rebels and who take the risk. Now, she did take risks, but because there was this huge international National Committee to Free, you know, United Committee to Free Angela Davis with liberals and Gloria Steinem and educators and academics and all those white students she went to school with since she was a sophomore in high school, right, up through getting your, her doctorate. Those were people who could be put in play who would not be in play for Geronimo Pratt, who is a vet, you know, Purple Heart, which means, you know, different things are different people in Vietnam and dedicated to free people by any means necessary. This, Davis would be the kind of person that the middle class could embrace with no qualms and also become hypercritical of the state for even thinking about burying her under a jail or under a prison. That same kind of consideration and passion would happen in small groups of people for the others, but it would never be, you know, even with a campaign for Mumi Abu-Jamal, it would never reach that level of international coordination with the Soviet Union understanding this is great propaganda for us. So, I mean, it's so many different avenues we can go down um, because you touched on, you know, I mean, folks definitely need to not only read this book, but to go beyond. Um, I, I wanna, you know, listening to the whole issue of class when you talk about the CPU, CPUSA um, and remembering Rochelle McGee, who's now an ancestor rising power to Rochelle McGee, who served 67 years in prison, 67 years um, in prison, who was Angela's co-defendant before her attorneys separated the, uh, the, the case. Um, and I, I guess that would explain why, of course, Michelle wasn't the quote unquote icon because he said that, you know, basically he had the right to rebel, you know, um, he had as a, as a quote unquote enslaved African, like his namesake, uh, Sinke, he had the right to rebel. Um, I want to go because you, you talked about how her her family uh, moved her to moved her uptown. You know what I'm saying? Moved her you know, to New York City. Is that moved, uptown? Yeah, moved moved her on up. You know what I mean? Took her up out of uh, Birmingham and said, "Let's go to uh, uh, New York and and to New England and you know let's uh, go amongst this these, these elite um, mm -hmm. white." Uh, youth who can somehow uh, be of assistance in the future, right? Um, I want to talk about chapter two, uh, Sally Davis's Red Diaper Babies. Mm -hmm. um, Sally Davis being Angela's mother. I want to, you know, give us a little bit about who she was, because I think that it's important um, when we talk about the Communist Party USA, I, I kind of want to talk about her role in the CPUSA because you, you kind of mentioned in passing that she was a member of the Communist Party as well. So I want to, yeah, Let, let's kind of touch on that. If I'll read a section. There's under that chapter, Sally Davis's Red Diaper Babies. And people know what a red diaper baby is, I'm assuming, your audience. Yeah, go, ahead, go ahead and break it down anyway, because there's some folks. Well, I mean, the reds are the communists, right? So it's a play and a joke. You know, red diaper is like, oh, your parents were communists. So 
there's a section called Mama's Girls. And my reading may not be great, but I'm just going to read two chapters right quick. An older Angela Davis would acknowledge how her strong-willed, radical mother served as her most important role model in her youth. Mother and daughters, the Davis women, were cut from the same fine cloth of Black bourgeois intellectuals, courageous advocacy for communism or socialism, and a passion for social justice. Their graduate degrees from elite universities, the phenotypical bright equated with links to white genealogy, the fashionably attractive and strong will were embodied in the confident, if not proud or idealized, blacks or Negroes assimilating into the American dream and the pecking order within black communities in segregated sites. Their radical politics for structural change was the one disruptor in the narrative of assimilation. Since their activist mother had built a protective framework from the ground up around her children, she created a scaffold of post-war leftist connections that would serve her daughters well. Progress through education remained her primary goal for her four children, so she had two girls and two boys. But the girls, her daughters, were the ones who became radicals, not her sons, right? It's, in fact, one son became a professional football player. Uh, her primary goal for her four children and her students. Mrs. Davis's three decades of civil rights activism from 1937. So she worked on this Scottsboro boys case, the Scottsboro nine case, right? Where you had these black youth who were falsely accused of raping two white women who were sex workers. And then they were tortured and kept in prisons and jailed under the threat of execution for years. Mrs. Davis's three decades of civil rights activism from 1937 to 1967 put her in touch with luminaries from the Southern movement who organized in Alabama. That meant, and this is who her mother knew. So when you finally get to Davis, Angela Davis going on trial, right? In 1970, 71, her mother already knew these important people who would kick in so whether or not they were in the Communist Party was not the most central thing. It was whether or not you had a network of powerful, influential people. So here are the ones that um, Mrs. Davis, I believe, would have known. Rosa Parks, Coretta Scott King, Ralph Aberneth Abernathy, and Stokely Carmichael. As a university student, Angela Davis expressed little interest in or desire for her mother's Communist Party or the Southern Civil Rights Movement, led by Southern preachers, attorneys, sharecroppers, and SCLC. However, during her fugitivity and trial, the young Angela Davis would become the beneficiary of networks and skills honed by an older generation that had learned from the civil rights battles in the South and that had, they had learned from the fight against Jim Crow terrorism. So I'll stop there. So I went on about the Soviet Union having clout but there was a deep clout among these civil rights leaders. Now, granted, Davis was not interested in politics or organizing until she returned from Germany and started to do her graduate degree, her doctoral degree in philosophy at UC San Diego with the German philosopher um, Marcuse, Herbert Marcuse, who had also been her professor and mentor while she was in the underground in Brandeis, right? So it's like, if you had to protect something, you would want concentric circles. Like if they get through the outer perimeter, now they're gonna have to go through the next one and the next one and the next one. And Davis had multiple perimeters around her, but the, there was gonna be mutuality in these perimeters, if this makes sense, right? To support Davis as she became iconic around the globe would mean that you would have access to an icon. If you have an icon, you have legitimacy, you have, you know, as George would say, prestige and power to some degree. And you also have an avenue to assimilate into the American project. So who was doing fundraisers for Davis? It wasn't just Gloria Steinem. And I've already said, you know, she's a state feminist, totally brilliant. 
And I talk about the book, how, you know, she was put into play in the 1950s to counteract a narrative, you know, the narratives about Martin Luther King being relevant. And, you know, and actually there's this um, pamphlet that I managed to find through a colleague. You can't find it. It's supposed to be in libraries in the United States. I had to go to another country. But it's it's called titled A Review of Negroes Segregation. And it really is propaganda against the civil rights movement in the South, because you have photos of black and white students in college you know, reading, studying together, socializing. That was not the norm of the 1950s, but that's the propaganda the U.S. had to project out into the world, particularly when you start seeing people being lynched, murdered, beaten, the, you know, dogs, sick, dumb people, um, fire hoses, et cetera, et cetera, right? So in these concentric circles that are zones of protection, the civil rights leaders were also powerful. Now, they didn't always, not all of them, Ralph Abernethy and others, they might have supported some people who were with the Black Panther Party, probably less so the Black Liberation Army. But at some point, they also became political celebrities, whether or not they wanted to be political celebrities. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Like, this is a commercial culture. It sells everything. It sells and markets our movements. And, you know, and using that selling power is one way you can create icons who hopefully can get other people out. Unfortunately, the record of getting other people out without them serving 20, 30, 40 years, um, it did not work for the majority, but it worked in this case. The consider Nina Simone, brilliant, brilliant artist, right? So again, I in this book, I don't talk about Davis's fugitivity, and it was a fugitivity with the CPUSA. She did not go into a black underground, revolutionary underground. So even though the Cleavers thought, oh, she'll be in Algiers or we're looking for her, no, she was staying with the Communist Party until they said it's the right time to, you know, quiet arrest. Nobody, no police officer or detective pulls out a gun, FBI, CBI. It's nothing like what happens to Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, you know, December 4th, 1999. Or it. Nobody's shot. Nobody's brutalized. They politely say, can we, um, we're going to lift your lip to see if you have a gap. And then you do have a gap. So you must be Angela Davis. And this is your companion. So now we're going to, now we're going to take you to jail. It was the most, it was polite, but it's now, polite. I Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, I'm, I'm sorry, because every time I hear that particular portion of the story, right, we're, we're, we're saying that, that you mentioned that she wasn't with the Black Underground. No. You know, she wasn't in hiding. She was well, being... She, wasn't, she was in hiding, but she was not... There's no right. communique like the Black Underground. There's no political organizing. You're just like you're waiting until it's time to be arrested in a quiet arrest. So it kind of feels like it's coordinated. But again, in, New York City. Really put, in the yeah, Midtown Manhattan. Right. And so the Muslims are like, why don't you hide with us in Harlem? Why are you in Midtown? Right. So there's all these like debates going on, like what kind of fugitivity? Because it's it's very unique. But again, like I didn't want to focus on it because it's not in the book. But what I was trying to say, these concentric circles reflect the power that you could get from the imperial US if you can tap into the right people to deliver, to deliver you some kind of chips or some kind of possibilities. Does that make sense? Mm, yes, it, it does. It does. Um, yeah, can I have one more thing? Okay, I'm sorry, I keep don't want to go into no, the book, no. but I keep doing it. So again, oh, yeah. it's not in the book. So Nina Simone, who that's what I started with, she shows up with red balloons to the jail where Davis says, and then she gets into this argument because the card's like, you can't bring red balloons in here. And basically she's like, yes, I can. And she wears the guards down. And remember, she's on she's she's incarcerated for conspiracy, kidnapping and murder. So there's a serious charges. Right. And so she delivers the red balloons and that becomes um, it becomes one of the stories that tells you about the possibilities in America. But you have to read the subtext. It is not possible for the common person. Right. So it becomes the extraordinary person 
who as bright as they are and as dedicated as they are, are made extraordinary by the people around them. Because what kind of people around, can you have around you to make you so extraordinary that you can hide in Manhattan? I mean, first of all, you're like the most wanted black woman on the planet. Right, and right. Probably one of the most wanted individuals on the planet, period. And and you're hiding in the middle of New York. I mean, I mean, I, I'm 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 stuck on that. But no, go ahead. I don't want you to be stuck on it because it's not in the book, but I'll right. try to answer it. It reflects the concentric circles that I was talking about before. Like if if and I don't like look, here's the deal. I can't say what I would do if I was facing life in prison. I would probably would take any deal you offered me if I wasn't betraying anybody, right? Or implicating somebody. So if you say we have a powerful network and we're part of it is gonna be Soviets, like I don't have a problem with that because I joined the CPUSA. Like when I was in grad school, you know, our doctoral student. And, and for a couple of weeks with the Panthers, wasn't a good fit. So went over to CPUSA. The icon, though, is not built around the Communist Party USA because they didn't have the, you know, that aura that the Panthers. So the, the thing that will stick later on Davis is being a Panther. And Davis says they were rank and file. And it looks like for a couple of weeks, you know, doing syllabi and educational materials. But, you know, two weeks is different from almost 20 years, which is their their allegiance to the Communist Party USA. So what you're seeing then, the persona is partly shaped by what the public wants. Right. They want something that is like as gritty and as exciting as a Panther alliance, not your mother's or your grandmother's Communist Party USA. There's nothing like... That was really important, but it doesn't it doesn't sell. Does that make sense? Without a doubt. And so when you're building, when you see icons form, I don't think they're driven by the individual per se, necessarily. I think they can be driven or the architecture can come from older skilled people who understand the value of the icon. Hmm. And so Contextualizing Angela Davis talks about a lot of different people. The, you know, the 200 whatever pages in here, the, the definitely Davis is central, you know, it's, it's about her. But no, Davis didn't create the icon. Other people created the icon out of Davis. And those are the people you want to watch. Like who has the power to make an icon? Like you just you just made it like all this stuff is going on right now and y'all threw down and you have a global brand and it, it looks good for multiple reasons. So like what's not in this book, too, is like how many people have their autobiography, you know, how many people write their autobiography in Toni Morrison's kitchen or as the guests of Edel in Havana, like Morrison is editing your work and then putting it out. By random house. Of course, it's going to be a bestseller. And of course, people are going to read it. And that's another formation. And I'm pretty sh not sure, don't know, because Davis and I don't really talk together much like we used to, you know, years ago. But I think Davis was instrumental in Morrison also getting Blood in My Eye published from Random House. And some works, you know, by Huey. I think it was to die for the people. I can't remember which one it was, you know. So there, but what Morrison actually says, because I do research, this is a thing. I'm a scholar. I'm not a hater for all you people, like cut it out. I'm a scholar. So what Morrison actually says, if you do the research, is that Random House was not going to turn down these books because this was the height of black power. And so this was edgy literature for all those white consumers and everybody else. Like, this is so titillating. Oh, wow, you have these beautiful black people with these huge afros. I mean, there's a fetish going on around this as well, which black people are not trying to project, but you know, people will dump that on you, right, to sell stuff. And it's like, here are the beautiful young black militants and we've got their books. And it's yeah. for the you know, price of, whatever, 1999, whatever the price is going to be, you can buy these books and be informed. 
or for black people, you can buy these books and see yourself as a projection or an extension or a lineage. So other people who are organizing, you know, Blood in My Eye is published after George is assassinated in prison. Right, right. Yeah. So these are not, these books are not really being sold as organizing tools. And if, if you're reading Davis, it's not, it's like, here's where I grew up. It was like, and here's where I went to all these schools. And then here's what I did. And it's a life of an academic who becomes globally known based on what a 17 year old does because he loves his brother. Right. Right. That That's really heavy right there. When you, when you, um, when you think about it and also, um, as you mentioned, blood in my eyes, Soledad brothers and all of that brother, you know, they're, they're, um, yeah, it was a no brainer for her to come out with an autobiography. I mean, it's like, you, you can't lose. Okay. But wait, 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 I'm sorry. I'm just going to jump in. It was not, it was not her idea if you read her autobiography or if you read, you know, things that she said. It was Morrison's idea, which tells me it was Random House's idea. See, this is what I'm saying. It's concentric circles. Like a 27-year-old who's been traumatized because, right, John, who she's, there's pictures of her protesting with John. She knew their family. She ate over their house. You Like the 17-year-old is dead, right? And now she's got to go underground. That was an interesting choice, but that was the choice. And the Communist Party greenlit the choice. She, I don't. She's not doing anything based on what she wants to do. Older people are like, this is the play. We're going to hook you up with somebody in Chicago. And I don't know if you've ever been to Chicago before, but it doesn't matter. Like, we're going to hook you up. You're going to move around. The man she's with, his mother, his father's a black communist, perhaps deceased. His mother is a multimillionaire white woman who's a real estate person. She buys cars. She buys a condo. Like it's a kind of, it's a kind of underground that is rare and lets. There's a lot of people who are organizing it. So right. then, after things settle, there is going to be a global book tour, and this is how the icon expands through literature. And this is why I critique my industry of academia because the the books that we put put out as important as they are they're not how to say it they're those are different books from the people who actually engaged in material struggle as rebels against the state remember the article we wrote for inquest the harvard law thing the title and there's philosopher you know from north carolina actually she came up with you know i don't think she came in a conversation. She's like, there's a citizen, right? I don't know if she wants me to say her name, so I'll just say, there's the citizen and there's a slave rebel. And Rusha McGee embodies that. He embodies the slave rebel. Davis embodies the citizen. So what you see are concentric circles of citizens making sure that one of their own is not going to spend the rest of their life in prison. Hmm. And she's acquitted by an all white jury, right? And then there's the uh, writing the memoir, the autobiography, and then going on book tour across Europe and everywhere else. But that makes sense if that if if that's understandable what I'm trying to say. You you can talk about um the the National United Committee to Free Angela Davis, right? It did become the alliance, right? That has now been revitalized with Frank Chapman in Chicago, you know, to free political prisoners, you know. Um, but there's, how to say this, I when I read it, and so people need to do their own studies and make their own determination. When I read this, there's, there's an emphasis on exoneration and getting people out, but in a way that you have to suppress the fact that they were rebels because it's citizens that get out because citizens, by the very definition of the term, I'll say I'm a citizen, you know, why not? We obey the state. The rebels are like, why you're predatory. I mean, why would, you, you have no, this is a thing about George, absolutely brilliant. 
I don't think that Davis in, in George Jackson agreed on fascism, even though I see people collapse the two continuously. I don't think she collapses the two, right? So what I'm trying to say that this is a very sophisticated and complex engagement that cannot be about an individual person or an individual personality. This is why you have concentric circles and people on all levels of the state, of like the communist party, of like we work for the agency, all levels involved because they want a win-win situation. And I've written before, this is what the win-win was, again, not focused in this book, but I said it was a win-win for the Soviets because they got a global icon. And that was somebody who could, um, again, a black radical with a fro like linked to the Panthers. Um, that was somebody who could energize the Soviet youth. And like, we support the Panther, you know, through Davis kind of thing, right? That we have this icon, this beautiful icon that came out of the US and she's talking to us in East Germany. And she's rallying us, but also like stay within the parameters of the state because the Soviet Union constructs that region of what is the state. And she's aligned to that, right? So, and then there's the black women who are like, they're doing the froze, like looking for Angela, like, you know, we're gonna all look like Angela so you won't be able to find her. There's so many sectors once the underground is triggered, right? But again, the care and love that are extended are not the equivalent of having a plan for revolutionary struggle because the Soviets didn't want a revolutionary struggle either. That's why they agreed to peaceful coexistence. The US was the only nation that ever used a nuclear weapon. And Soviets are like, we're not gonna be second. You know, it's like, did Japan, you're not gonna do us, we'll support the global South and liberation, you know, until we stop supporting it. But this alignment of the three worlds, I would say the third world would have been like the incarcerated. That would have been George and John, even if they're in the US, it's the internal colony. But the internal colony did not have the money, the connections, I could go on and on, that would place it with any kind of peerage with the Western world and the Soviet world, where they're negotiating, creating icons among themselves and seeing who would win. And in this case, fortunately for Davis and for us who are aligned, you know, nobody wants to see anybody like spend decades in prison. It worked out. I'm sure it was painful, but there were a lot of people on different continents who were like, this is gonna, we're gonna make sure this works. And so one thing I will wrap in saying, about when, you know, the alliance against racist and political repression, the national alliance, that's, you know, what Frank Chapman now heads in Chicago. So that is what grew out of her defense committee. But consider, right, that is a very broad base because it included Joanne Little, the, wo the woman, the young black woman who stabbed the white prison guard who was raping her and then went underground and then became in some ways an icon herself, right? But not on the statue of Davis. And then this Davis writes an important article, it gets published in Ms. Magazine. Gloria Steinem somehow is given the resources to create Ms. Magazine right after her service you know, to the state and stuff like that. But if you're willing to see the, the remember we talked about the Rubik's Cube, right? Okay. If you're willing to put the puzzle pieces together, then you can stand back and say, oh, I understand the trajectory because I understand the power plays. If you think individuals can be icons by themselves and walk and yeah. then become beloved, you know, represented by Time Magazine, which you brought up, like all these liberal entities, then you're not, you're so close to the celebration of power that you don't really see how power works. Mm. So, so why, why do you feel, and, and I mean, I have a couple more questions. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, that's I'm, okay. You know, but, but the masses, right? Yeah. Because we, we, 
you know, unfortunately, you know, I, I feel like at times we, we've suffered so many losses that anything that looks like a win is like, you know, like with the whole thing with, with, with Fonnie Willis. Her, her and, um, oh, yeah, and that's such a mess. I'm sorry yeah. about that. You're hurting my heart. By even nah, I, I, I live here, so my feelings, my hurt. No, you're, my you hurt. feel it more than I yeah. do. Okay, go yeah, ahead. It, because what it is, it becomes like, you know, black girl magic. It becomes, you know, it, it doesn't matter that Kamala was a, um, you know, was, was railroading um, humans, trafficking, you know, Africans in the California prison system. Yeah, as a district Ooh. attorney, right? Yeah, yeah. So she, she's first black vice president. It's all good. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter that that Angela's um, her uh, mm -hmm. her on the run tour was similar to Jay Z and Beyonce. You know what I'm saying? It was a, a celebration. You know, you're buying cars, you're renting mm -hmm. spots. You, 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 you. I mean, that's a hell of all on the run. You know, you get book deals the whole nine. You have a PR campaign behind you have power behind you um you're hiding in the city you know not to keep bringing it up but i i mean why is it that our people are, are okay. caught up in cult of personality what, you know what yeah okay i'm not gonna be devil's advocate with you because you know it wouldn't work and so i'll just try to keep it basic all right no problem. We, we, we fared it out. My interpretation, so I'm not saying this as a scholar, I'm just start talking as a person. I believe that we've been so traumatized over generations that we need a win. And if the win is a compromise, I mean, it's a real win because she was not, you know, I think it was 17 or 18 months, and then she got to go live her life and, and recover because I'm sure that she deeply cared about both Jonathan Jackson and George Jackson. So John dies August 7th, 1970 by prison guards shooting up a van. And George dies August 21, uh, 1971 by prison guards shooting him in the back when he's running to a wall, which would be impossible to scale if you've ever seen prison walls made out of concrete. Right. So. I think that we can't talk about anybody's individual trauma except acknowledge it, but I think we could talk about our own trauma. And then when we like, oh, wow, one got out or somebody got, you know, like they didn't get this one. Like, and we so, I mean, think of the assassinations like in a row, 63 Megard Evers, and before that, 65, you know, Malcolm X, Emily Gal Shabazz, 68. Um, Reverend okay. King, 69, Fred Hampton. Yeah. You just, just keep it rolling, right? Yeah, yeah. Like the state. Go back to Patrice and. and oh, yeah. Oh, Patrice, please. And th this is why I have issues with the CIA women. The and why I have issues with CIA. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I've got to put a little caveat in here because I know, like, people, some people don't like my work, which is okay. But I'll tell you clear, my work is scholarship. So whether you like it or not, it's real. So if you want to avoid, you know, reality or material realism, whatever, that's that's totally up to you. Nobody asked you to buy it, but it's real. And so the conundrum we're in is that we're very aspirational and we're probably very frightened. And this is what I really like about Mumia's Love Not Fear. First, I was like hating on it. And then I was like, okay, I saw the light. So if we loved ourselves, and we do more, that's what I was going to add, there's a possibility we could accept the, the losses in real time with, without creating iconic figures. You should celebrate people for their writings, their teaching, everything else. But a revolutionary leader is, is that's not what academic elite academics are. That never was the case. Or if they were like Walter Rodney, he couldn't, they wouldn't let him keep a job and then they assassinated him anyway. So if, if you're going to be feted and celebrated by liberals and like a lot of money is going to flow in from nonprofits, which again, I've said before, that's, you know, 
revenue from monetization of black death, because again, to go back to class, it's the black working class and the black poor are getting shot up or beaten to death mostly by police officers, right? So if you want to win, that would require us rethinking how we organize against predatory violence from the state. But if you want a symbolic win that somehow expands over you know five decades or 50 years and touches everybody and, and we're on the right track, I, I, don't, I don't think that's grounded in reality. I mean, those names, some of them, names Rosa Parks, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer, I don't believe was one of the names, but we come from people who kept it real. They didn't have to create icons and they didn't have to celebrate. Like I think you've said on some of your podcasts, don't claim any easy victories, right? And I'm sure it's painful to people in the middle of it, but the way it worked out, they got a very influential icon. And so that's the subtitle. It's, it's, it's an icon. So there's a person in there somewhere. We don't know the person, so we can't judge a person. But we can make an assessment on iconography and see if it's opening pathways to liberation or if it's closing those doors because we have this false security that we can pull something off. When, you know, I was trying to lay out without talking about the stuff that's not even in this book, that there are compromises made with state and with liberals in order to get certain outcomes. And you don't have to go to a past century or past decades. You could just talk about this century and what's going on right now. Like even as we protest or don't protest or to whatever degree, we resist a genocide. We're clearly doing it in ways, except for the kids that got docs and the people that got arrested and harassed by the NYPD and others. But a number of us who are middle class are doing it in ways that we maintain our security, our personal security, our personal standing. Like, you know, I need to keep my job. And, and it's legit. Like, I, you know, you got kids, you got elders, you need health care, et cetera, et cetera. But you cannot overshadow the people who just said, you know, I'm doing it. Like, I'm, I'm going to the streets. I'm getting, I'm going to get into these protests. And people who risk their lives to stop brutal wars that we're forced to fund. And then it becomes very problematic if we're going to build concentric circles with genocidal leaders. Like, I would be like, well, maybe we just... Maybe we're going to hit a point where having these concentric circles of care and protection from the state and nonprofit, it's just going to be like sold too much of whatever is left of the soul to even keep this up. But I believe we inherited a model of celebration and we should celebrate, but we inherit a model that doesn't engage in contradiction or context. So everything becomes like celebratory. It's like, were there any errors, any falls, or did anybody lie at any time? Or did you bring on somebody from the state? And again, at an age of 20 something, again, Davis was not making any of these decisions, but the people were like, we can get you out. And they were very confident. That means that they had connections and ties that had been existing for years before she was ever arrested. And that means those connection and ties continue to this day. Some people will get out. Other people will stay in until right before they die or, you know, transition while they're there. I would like to see, like, just share, like, who are your contacts? Who do you know? Who, you know, like, just share it all. Like, if that's a form of power, like, let's just be transparent and just say, hey, how did you manage to, you know, do that? Yeah, yeah. That special trick to levitate out of, you know, it's because you knew all the right people, but the same people, again, that would be another book. Like where were the Ivy League attorneys for Rochelle McGee? Right, right. I mean, he hardly had attorneys, period. 
as we yeah, he was he was representing himself but here's the deal to go back to the philosopher who put it on the table who shell said he was a rebel slave that he was enslaved by the state he had the right to resist and run and actually where he's going based on our research he was going to a radio station to tell the public about the barbarity and the brutality of prisons that is literally where he was going. He wasn't going offshore to fight in it. He was like, I need to tell the public. I can't tell you inside the walls. So like, just drop me off. I don't know how they thought that was going to work. But yeah. what they thought was probably similar to the people who rebelled in Attica. They weren't trying to leave the prison. They were trying to bring dignity and end the brutality and the torture. And what happens the National Guard shoots through the prison guards who are hostages to kill the rebels. The sure. same thing happens in 1970 with John. Now, if we can be honest about that, that this is the template that the state will use on a regular basis, then maybe we could talk about shared resources, that some people are more likely to be shot than others, right? And then the people who are more likely to be shot, maybe we should prioritize them. Or maybe we should just, you know, maybe we should be candid about how this works. It's a very intricate play. And it's not a play that people on the ground could pull off unless they had access to people who were above ground. And I don't mean underground, but there's like multiple tiers, people who were like in high places yeah. um, and who had contacts. That, that um, I mean, that little... You know, I mean, that, that it, for the viewers or listeners, however you're checking out this broadcast, um, you're listening to and you're checking out RSTV. We have Dr. Joy James talking about contextualizing Angela Davis, the agency and identity of an icon. Right. Um, you, you mentioned that you're not a hater, you know, and that you, you said I'm not a hater. I'm a scholar. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> I didn't say, but let's, awesome be like, let's be clear. I never, I never said I was a perfect person or that every day was a good day for me. Okay. Right, but here's right. the deal. I don't make up facts and I don't bullshit. Hmm. So even in the process of doing this book, it was not my idea. It was 2016. I remember it because it's the night that Trump got elected. I was staying at friend's house. I'm like four in the morning. Oh my God, he got elected. What happened? Because I did what I was told to do. I voted for Hillary. Yes, I did. I was told to do that. I did it. So we 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 not we not going. You you not you won't be voting for Hillary again, will you? Obviously, I will. But it, okay. yeah, because it would be like more genocides, right? But what I'm trying to say is, I get this email from an editor, head editor from a British publication. And he's like, why don't you, we want you to do a biography on Davis. And I'm like, I'm not a biographer. I'm not a historian. No, thank you. Then the emails keep coming. Yeah, you could do it. It'll be fun. Literally they wrote, it would be fun. It's like, it was not fun. And this went on for a couple of weeks and I was like, okay, I'll do it. And I start doing research. And it's at the same time, you know, when your elders are trans, you know, people are, there's a lot going on always in family life, right? But then I start doing research and I start finding contradictions. And I'm like, wait, I don't want to do this. This is this is not, this isn't, there, there are people who are going to have real problems with my work, right? And I'm not writing for people who have problems with my work and I'm not writing to please you. I just write what I see. And so we finally reach a point, like they keep trying to get me to write it. And I said, I'm, I don't do hagiographies. And that's where you just like build up somebody like they're immaculate and they're just perfect. I say, no, there's always contradictions. I'm not perfect. Humans are imperfect. So can we all just be honest about contradictions, right? And it finally reaches this point where, okay, so I'll tell you. So it finally reaches this point where they're like, we're a mid-sized press and we can't afford to be sued. And I was like, no, but that would be against me and it would be libel, but I don't do libel. I do research, right? And that means like I've done these drafts and they're really messy because it's so complicated and contradictory, but they send them out to all these prominent academics who obviously know people. And so we agreed to, to part ways. And so there were, this book was never going to come out, but, you know, white women, this is a white man, um, and women of color reached out to me and they said, we hear you have a project. And I stalled them for months. It's like, it's not worth it. 
because I've already been like given the sign, like you don't want to do this. First, you want to do it, but you won't do it the way we told you to write it. So, you know, don't write, you know? And it eventually came out, I think the people who were supportive, but it, is, it came out as a piece of, of scholarship. And that's why I stop at 1970 before I mentioned what happened with John and the, you know, taking her weapons. And it was in a communal house. The weapons were not in her house. She lives somewhere else. So there's like a communal house, black house, that people come in and out. And apparently the weapons were not locked up. They were just in a, you know, in a storage place. And he took the weapons and he also took her books with her signature. Like he's 17. And he probably thought the outcome was going to be different. Like, you know, we're people are going to be reasonable. We'll have an, a swap exchange. Then we'll go out and fight liberation wars. And then we'll read these books. And maybe we'll die on the battlefield or maybe not. But the dishonor and the contempt to just shoot up a van and shoot your white judge and kill him at the same time. It's just the predatory violence is so stunning. And maybe that's why it disappears in a lot of the narratives. I mean, sometimes like people tell the facts, but they won't dwell in them. So I'm for, glad. Me, Good. Sorry, for me, it's the most important thing is to be honest. And these are not books that are going to make you popular. Just like Taylor Branch, when he was talking about Martin Luther King and started talking about his affairs, like nobody really wanted to know the details, but then you kind of understood until you got that radical King at the end why he kind of backed away from J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, you know, he's a multiple murderer, um, but the FBI had, who was wiretapping King and having his agents suggest that King commit suicide before he was exposed as a fraud. He was human. He, he you know, whatever comfort he was getting from other women, that's what he was doing, but he still did the job which was to say the truth, right? So there's all these ways in which the academy almost by default doesn't want to hear, quote, bad news, which is factual in order to assess where we are and where we need to go. Because the function of the academy is not to promote black liberation. So I don't care what they say, that literally, that's not how you get these jobs and keep them. You can be a specialist in something and you can offer templates and things like that. But if the nitty gritty of, lap, of black liberation is a confrontation with an imperial state, the academy is not promoting that. So you can talk about identity and culture and care and you know Afros and what we did in the 60s and 70s and abolition, but it, for me, most of it stays within the permissible quarters, which are not considered to be threatening to the stability of the academy. And then you start seeing these formations that get a lot of money and support. Like, I'll give you two examples and I'll stop. Like, people, and I've said this on Two Blacks uh, show about a week or two ago, I think a lot of the bashing of Afro-pessimism was about people trying to protect their brand. I'm not sure they even read the work because the work from Frank Wilderson and Jared Sexton and others, I'm not talking about the people who were disengaged from political struggle because those two were engaged in political struggle in various ways. The work is very complex. And if you actually are reading and not treating them as a competitive brand, then you would understand, you know, when Wilderson says in his writes in his memoir, and, and people banned that book, and I was trying to help him get it published, and he eventually got it published because the head editor walked down from a prestigious press and was and killed it, even though the low the people editors who actually did the selection, he overrode them because Wilderson talks about um setting up a scenario where um Nelson Mandela has to push him because he's trying to show that Mandela is really aligned with a more liberal project, whereas Chris Hani is aligned with a revolutionary project, right? But anyway, back to the academy, all the 
all the like stuff slur, you know, thrown at them, like throw the garbage and see if it stays. I think it was about their radicalism. And also they had complex theory. So I'm not sure the Academy wants radicalism or complex theory. And so they picked up the language now, like anti-blackness is a big thing, but you try to like banish or marginalize the people who created a school of thought. I don't have a school of thought, not trying to have a school of thought, but I do have scholarship. And if you don't like a certain kind of radicalism, that's fine. But if you're going to ban it, like, is what are we doing? Leftist book banning while the right is doing rightist book banning? Right. Like, that doesn't make sense. Like, even if somebody's work contradicts yours and is not flattering to you, it is not about our, now I'm preaching, it is not about our individual egos as academics. It is about can we be useful in a struggle in which the people who are, impacted most by violence are going to be working class, impoverished, undocumented, or in, in Gaza or the Congo, where we're funding their death. Hmm. Let me let me ask, because, um, you know, we, we, we'll go down a whole other rabbit hole. We're not mm -hmm. going to go. We got, we're not going to talk about the commodifying of black death and the pain mm -hmm. and, and the packaging and the the rebranding that the academy and uh, many of its subscribers uh, participate in uh, on a daily. Um, I want to ask because I know, you know, we, we talked about uh, earlier. You mentioned meeting Angela, right? Yeah. I want to um, ask about uh, when and how did you all start working together? Because I know that, um, you know, it, it it was just a brief, like, as if you, you met one day and said hi and kept on moving. Yeah, okay. And, and, and then you write the book about it. What, um, <laughs> oh, maybe like 40 years later. Okay, so I'll, hey. do, I'll do my version of a quick one. Okay, so um, I, like I said, I'm a military brat, grew up with conservative people, but they understood war. So, you know, I, I, I don't try to mystify it came to New York uh, to get a doctorate and I started organizing with women. And there were two formations. One were the black internationalist women who like, were, you know, who helped create Megar Evers College, right? But on the, and December 12th committee, sometimes I hung out with them a bit. I think you're familiar with them. Um, yeah, along with Brath, right? Yeah. And Nomza, his wife, they're the ones who vetted me before I could speak to Yusef Salam's mother and write about the Central Park case that this is a railroad thing, right? So very brilliant activists and loving people. So for me, I also ended up working with RE, Women for Racial and Economic Equality. So RE was actually CPUSA. I didn't know that. I was a Texan. And it didn't matter, you know, um, but they trained me. And then the person I've mentioned in the book, because I think the preface is important. I, I mentioned um, Charlene, the, Mitchell. Charlene Mitchell, right? The woman who recruited Angela Davis into the Communist Party in 1968. So Charlene Mitchell also mentored me because she lived in Harlem and I would go visit. And when we're out in California, because yes, I spent time with Davis and I'll circle back about like particulars how we met. Um, in 83 in Manhattan. That was the first time I met her at a re-conference. But Mitchell told me to go into the Schomburg. I've said this before, um, the book, Transcending the Talented Ten, she was one of my first books. I wouldn't have done it, but Mitchell told me to read every memoir um, W.B. Du Bois had written. And, and then after I did that in the Schomburg, um, I realized that he repudiated the NAAC, let, uh, like whoever he was as a talented 10, which he promoted mm -hmm. from the souls of black folk that was published in 1903. And the whole concept comes from white philanthropists. So we've said it before. Spelman is named after a white woman, a Rockefeller, and Morehouse College is named after Henry Morehouse, a white philanthropist. So this whole training of us for education, but the training is engineered by white elites who wanna stabilize the nation 
not you know liberated from its racism and capitalism that's an imprint so mitchell was you know really had an impact on me and um whenever i could like i would check in with her and i started writing because of the politics i did not i never did anything with my dissertation on hannah Arendt. it was the politics that led me to write so resisting state violence i talk about you know, the fights with the NYPD, you know, in front of the UN or on a bridge, that was engaged organizing. So through Reed, they had this conference in a high school auditorium. So this is before the celebrity stuff, right? So it's a high school auditorium. It's not anywhere near full. And the keynote is Davis. And so the Re women, mostly white women, um, introduced me to her. And then two years later, we're at the UN decade. Um, I talk a little bit about this in the preface in Nairobi, um, UN decade on women. Maureen Reagan, who's um, Ronald Reagan's daughter, he's president. She's leading the US delegation and we're, um, we're not the US delegation. So uh, RE is a US affiliate of WIDF the Women's International Democratic Federation that was formed in the 1940s. So they, this is the importance of the Soviets and the Chinese communists. So after World War II, it was formed as an anti-fascist organization. And there were women around the globe who were affiliated. So there were Palestinian women, PLO women, there were ANC women, SWAPO women, FMLN. So I was with the US contingent with WIDF. So we were in Nairobi and we were petitioning and organizing. This is the first time I was actually organizing to get a petition against nuclear weapons and also children's rights to have like food, housing, shelter. And, you know, it, all of the predatory violence in the US, we were condemning and we were collecting these um, signatures. But where we stayed had an impression on me. We did not stay in the hotels in Nairobi where, you know, the US delegation, the president's delegation, Reagan were, you know, I'm pretty sure Gloria Steinem was there too, like under whatever capacity. We ended up in a compound and it took me a while to understand what was going on because I was in my early twenties and nobody was telling anybody, any, me anything. Cause I was a grunt. I was like, pick up the bags, watch everybody. And I remember the Italian women were very obnoxious because they wanted Davis's autograph. So I had to make them stand in line and wait. And then they were taking photos of uh, Maasai men and that was against their culture. So I'm like yelling at them. Like, if you want an autograph, you better put your camera down, right? But so that's a side thing. But where we were staying, that was a place that had incredible armed um, protection. Like we get off the bus and when we walked by these like gorgeous brothers, like with locks and their assault weapons on them and their fatigue. And I was like, why are we in this military zone? And then it dawned on me that one place, that one zone outside of the city had every organ, every revolutionary woman leader in the formations of third world liberation in the world were in that one building. And so that's when I got to get more perception or perspective, right? Because Davis was not a guerrilla fighter because she wasn't because she said, you know, they took my guns without my permission. She wasn't a guerrilla fighter. But inside the building, there would have been guerrilla fighters, women who had been in the bush and then became diplomats, right? And moved up like the different levels. And a lot of this anchored and funded by this, I'm pretty sure by the Soviet Union. I paid for my own ticket. I paid for, you know, being able to stay there. But it was one of the, the most transformative. And I wasn't focused on, I was assigned to Davis. Like, you know, make people line up, be polite to her. Like they were, they loved her. So, and I'm not talking about people, I'm talking mostly about the Europeans. Those are the people that, you know, had a fetish. and. I was, I just was getting like, I, this is not what I signed up for, but it was, so I did that. But to be with these liberators, these women who were, who were fighters, 
And so I still appreciated Davis, but I got a, I got to see, like there were women who had fought the Nazis, you know, as snipers, like who were in WIDF. I mean, they may not physically be there because I don't remember everybody who was there, but this is why I think context is so important. There is nothing like that today. There's nothing like that today. And that's what I was saying in the preface. Then there were three worlds. And you could oppose the U.S. because there was backing from another zone, the Soviets, whether it was going to be military or for Henry Winston, he was incarcerated. He went blind and they, they flew him to Moscow so he could have eye surgery. The same with Claudia Jones. She was incarcerated. Her health was deteriorating. And then she went to London and then to, you know, Moscow. You know, there was there was this synergy and an inner relationship that even if you didn't know the people, like I knew to nod about like to the to the Palestinian women, to the Swapo women, the ANC women. I was just a grunt and I was so happy to be a grunt who could like, this is power. This is real power and it's women's power, but they're not like women. They were feminists too, but it wasn't like bougie stuff. It was like, we're freedom fighters. And then there was a whole other group of contingent because I remember we were organizing a conference on anti-imperialism. And then there were black women from the US who at the same time on the same day organized a conference on reproductive rights. So they drew away from us. And I was like, wow, this is so educational. So the liberals popped up and somebody figured out how to give them resources and told them, what, well, we had put flyers everywhere. We're anti-war, we're anti-imperialist, we're anti-capitalist. And then the people were like, and it's important to have reproductive rights. But that was their only issue. The and way. so that became the feminism. So like, don't go to that anti-imperialist, you know, you know, rally. Come over here where we talk as real women about real women's needs. And I'm like, well, real women need to not to be genocided or to be imprisoned and tortured or to be shot down like girls and boys in Soweto or anywhere. So this, you could see the bifurcation decades ago, but we were still under this rubric of identifying with socialists or communists. Now, the, the last thing I keep saying is the last thing, but I want to add this. The Black internationalist women schooled me because they told me, and I've said this to other people, because I went to Moscow a couple of times, like I mentioned, right? They were like, why are you over there and not over here? And I was like, I'm in both places. So let me just sort it out and figure out what I'm doing, right? But they were like, the Soviet Union is going to fall. And they started telling me that in 88. And then I would tell the older white women leadership of RE, which are CPUSA. And they did ask me to join. I declined because I thought I could keep organizing. That's not the case. So, you know, I kind of, it was just by sort of, but not in a rude way. So I tell them what I hear from the black women who are going back to the continent or in and out of the Caribbean and the older white woman in, in you know, in the CPUSA starts laughing, that will never happen. And then like in a year, and it did. And why did the sisters know? Because they knew that the liberation movements were being defunded, that the, the money was drying up, you know, the money, the, the uh, you know, the, the weaponry, whatever you needed to keep a fascist off of you, that was, that was closing down because Gorbachev was gonna make a deal with Ronald Reagan. And I, I think it's these deals behind the curtain that we don't want to look at. And maybe it was a deal that it was felt that, you know, we have to do it or whatever. I don't know. I don't, I don't have that pay grade to make an analysis. But I do know that it was women on the ground who told me the truth without projecting an imaginary future, you know? And from them and I still honor them, right? It was from there that I could, when I had a postdoc with Davis and she's teaching Foucault, Discipline and Punish, that I started this critique of Foucault and I was like, there's no black people 
or black suffering or black death or black resistance in this text. So they informed my scholarship by telling me, pay attention to the material world of struggle and mm -hmm. don't always go where you feel safe, right? With kind of middle-class people who you can roll with, you know, you're still gonna have to pay your way, but you'll be in compounds with security or you'll be here and there. If they're literally telling me to look at the ground. So the thing I could say in close is that I'm trying to remember what they told me from decades ago. Like, look at the ground. And the ground, you will see broken glass. You will see all kinds of refuse, all kinds of things that are discarded. But you also feel the earth and you see the flowers and the trees and everything else that blossoms. If we commit ourselves to being into the material reality of struggle, and not our projection of our emotional needs for struggle to be, you know, in some ways comforting because it does not look like a war zone. Right, right, right. That's, that's powerful. It's a, it's a powerful way to close, but I still got a couple more questions. Oh my gosh. You, you were like, I, like, you I like how you tried to. <laughs> I've said this to you three times. Well, I, this is your last question. So let me I've just been, like, make a time. I've been working with you it. long enough to know yeah. how you're going to throw a period on it. Yeah, this, I got this, it. This, this ain't GIU today. This is Oh, really? So. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Re no problem. Real quick, a yeah. um, couple, couple things. Um, one, because I did ask you about Angela and you gave us that beautiful story. How long mm -hmm. did you all work together? Um, because I, I, I need yeah, to. It was, yeah, it was it was off and <clears throat> on. So this, I'm on East Coast. Davis okay. is on the West Coast. I did get a postdoc. And so I spent a year. And, you know, that's when I did the Angela Davis reader. And that's when, you know, I'm sitting in the classroom as a postdoc saying, like, there's something not right with Foucault. And then later, be, I mean, um, sorry. Later, Davis does begin, you know, she starts critiquing Foucault as well. But my, I believe my critique is more severe because that's just how I see the world. Like I never met Foucault. I wasn't on panels with him. He's a certain kind of elite. He's, he's a deceased French intellectual theorist, probably best known for um, discipline and punish. He also, you know, signed a pamphlet that Jean Genet brought to him. Jean Genet did the forward to um, George Jackson's first book. And that was also engineered by Faye Stender, like a mm -hmm. white Jewish attorney who she was Huey Newton's attorney first, and then she became George Jackson's attorney. And that was a strategic book because she was trying to use um, Soledad Brother. She was trying to use it as a wedge of lever, like the concentric circles to right. save George's life. If we can promote him as this incredible writer and so it ended up in France. And, you know, so they, the French intellectuals were reading at Foucault. And Genet is a playwright and a poet, and he's amazing, right? And Davis actually is his translator when he goes on tour in the US to raise funds for the Panthers. Um, so there's a way, I don't try to say, there's a way in which there's all this interconnectedness, mm -hmm. but there's a way in which, we need to make clear, di di you know, differences or distinctions. Does that kind of answer your question? Or no, 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 no. That, that, that's that, that's on point. And I'm, I'm a, we go, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna put a period on it. Um, okay. After this, this, this one more question. Okay, Folks, go ahead. Me with the Chayla Mumba Club. Oh um, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, th okay, that one for me. Uh, that's just what I said. This is a difficult book to write because I was. You know, I would walk around like, you know, throw things like pillows at the wall because of the contradictions. So it's like, wait. So this is my assessment. I talk about it in the book because I do. I thank Charlene Mitchell for mentoring me. And she was the architect, pretty much. The black woman joined the Communist Party, 16, working class. Um, She's pretty influential with uh, Angela as well, correct? I mean, she was kind she's of the one that recruited Angela with, um, I believe there were other people as well, but she was key. And so Angela became in some way, you know, if I'm not a psychologist, but whatever, I would see this as a surrogate mother, right? And so 
she had two brothers. And if you, there's a photo, I don't know if you want to hold it up. Um, there's only one photo in the book of Davis and Kendra Alexander mm -hmm. on at UCLA when the regents are trying to fire Davis um, because she acknowledged, yeah. So you can see the, you know, two beautiful sisters, they're froze. So Kendra is, is actually Charlene Mitchell's uh, sister-in-law. So this was like a small family thing that Che Lumumba is her two brothers, her sister-in-law, and they recruited Angela Davis, who decided whatever work she did with the Panthers, that it was going to be short-lived because it would make sense. The, the Che Lumumba would be more stable, but they couldn't just say it's part of the Communist Party. So this is what I mean about branding. So you take Che Guevara's name and you put it on it, and he was assassinated in 1967. And then you put Patrice Lumumba, who was assassinated in 1963, his name on it. So you get the hyphen Che Lumumba. And so for people in their teens and 20s, it sounds like, wow, this is on the cusp, or this reflects third world revolutionary struggle. When not really, it's really the CPUSA, but it's a branding like the, the youth are attracted to the Panthers right? They're not attracted to the, it's like your mom and your dad's or your grandma and granddad's political party, meaning it's left of the Democratic Party. And at some point, the Communist Party starts working with the Democratic Party, as we know, like go out and vote for the right candidates as they see it. So there's, it's a, it's a branding that's going on. And I do spend time talking about Patrice Lumumba. And I do talk about Che and how he died in Bolivia and how he's tortured and how the CIA reportedly shared logistics or locations, right? And then they write dismissive in, you know, their paperwork. But now, you know, Fidel will be able to structure and settle down because he's not seeking permanent revolution, but Che is. And I think that becomes part of the irony or the contradiction. The CPUSA is not seeking permanent revolution, not in the way that the youth were seeking it, you know, at Kent State or in the in the prisons or in the Panthers or, you know, in La Raza, in, you know, the Rainbow Coalition that um, Fred Hampton imagined, you know, and organized with the Appalachian whites and the Chicana Latino and the Black, you know, that kind of revolutionary from the ground was not what the CPUSA was about, because that's not what the CPSU was about. And even her, um, Davis's advisor, undergrad and in doctoral studies, Herbert Marcuse, he had a critique of a certain kind of um, political mandate coming out of the Soviet Union and out of the CPUSA, that the hierarchy, the central committee language, right, would not have the capacity to let the organic struggle emerge and come from young people who were not going to be as poised or polished or any on a central committee. So the, the, for me, the contradiction was to brand yourself as a revolutionary organization when you're really a small organization. And when, if you, what little I understand of Guevara, Ernesto Che Guevara, and what he said at the UN after they killed um, Patrice Lumumba, saying we would be happy to engage in peaceful coexistence. That's what the Soviet line was. And so the CPUSA picked it up as well, peaceful coexistence, which means you don't do armed struggle, right? And so after they killed Lumumba, Che went to um, the UN and said, we would be happy to abide by you know, peaceful coexistence if you stop killing us. And then a couple of years later, you know, Che would be you know, tortured and executed. So this is the contradiction, like, we brand things with revolutionaries' names on them, but we act more like the United Nations mm -hmm. than we act like. And the UN was like, we're not going to do anything for y'all, basically. They're going to keep killing you. 
and like we'll do a petition or we, I don't know what would you know they're not doing anything right now anyway in Palestine so you it's it's almost like you're forced to choose but then when people rebrand it and then like no just do what the state wants you to do and just name it after a revolutionary or create a revolutionary persona and stamp it with that persona and that vibe and that icon. And then that will reassure people we're on the right path because we are radicals and revolutionary because see the brand, didn't you read the name on the banner? So it was, it was clever. It didn't really work. If they only had five people, most of them were family members. It didn't really draw a lot of people, right? Mm. But, and then once Davis goes underground and basically disbands because the Alexanders are gonna use um, Kendra Alexander, and you saw her photo, and Franklin is was her husband, right? They're gonna use their energy to get Davis acquitted. And that is very important, but then you see like all this energy, all these funds just go in one direction. And there are other people still struggling and also trying to fight as revolutionaries who are going to disappear. So I want to end with Geronimo. Um, Geronimo was framed by the LAPD and, you know, others. He was actually at a Panther meeting in Northern California in Oakland. And Huey Newton, for whatever reasons, found him problematic and people could do their own research or they've already done their research and so they're more informed than I am. But people were told not to testify on his behalf that he did not commit shootings that led to the murder of a white woman on a tennis court in Southern California. Because if you know how long California is, you can't move from Northern California down to Southern California and you know within the time span that the cops put out. Right. So Huey Newton, I don't believe, wanted a revolutionary formation either. I don't believe that when he came out and took over the Oakland Panthers. So this is when, you know, Kathleen would leave, Eldridge Cleaver would leave, right? And later Kathleen would get um, a law degree from Yale and go back with Johnny Cochran and Stuart Hanlon and finally get Geronimo out after 27 years. And he gets like some multi-million dollar settlement that can't compensate for 27 years, which same a number of years as Mandela. When I say that to a prominent black historian, they're indignant. Well, he's no Mandela. And it's like, I'm not here to judge. It's a 27 is 27. Okay. Right. So when you're seeing um, Davis on trial, Rochelle McGee on trial, Geronimo Pratt on trial, you see how the resources are not there. Like Huey Newton is gonna support Angela Davis and so will Elaine Brown, but they're not gonna support Geronimo, who it wasn't even about what my guns use. He wasn't even there. There was nothing that tied him to that, you know, that tragedy, the, the husband was shot and then the wife was shot too and she died. Other than uh, FBI informant who probably was part of, he might've, I don't know if he pulled the trigger or not, but there's, it's a setup. And in, instead of the resources, cause I, I'm researching and I, there's this like newsfeed, like there are these brothers with the NAACP and they're trying to get the media to focus on Geronimo's case because Davis has six private attorneys. So again, this is not in the book. I'm just going the data, the research. And the media don't want to talk about Geronimo. They want to like, hey, tell us about Davis. And they're like, we're not, everybody's talking about Davis. Like everything, you know, the cameras, like the, you know, everybody's there. It's like, let's talk about Geronimo because he didn't do it. He wasn't there and we need to help this brother. And so, when you have an iconic figure, and again, she did not create the icon, other people did, not, not on these early stages, right? When you have an iconic figure, can you see that, that bright star behind you, that planet? An iconic figure that is supposed to reassure the mass or the people can become a veil that can dim out a star.
a real star, a revolutionary star or stars, that they disappear, right? Because they're overshadowed. It's an eclipse. And it's the eclipse that's shaped by the narratives in the New York Times, the narratives everywhere. When people finally get on board, like Richard Nixon got on board. Once people are on board, it's like we're gonna have we're gonna prove we're a real democracy and make sure that this goes down well. But you didn't say that about Geronimo, you didn't say that about Rochelle, you didn't say that about Sekou, you didn't say that about Kamal Siddiqui, you didn't say that about the Pendleton too. Like you frame people, but it's like it's show business. And and that's what we have to we have to move the veils away. Even if it hurts our eyes, we have to see the brightness. We y'all, I mean, made incredible contributions, risked everything. And we can't obliterate that or distort it. We just have to grapple with that and manage our fear and figure out how material struggle and scholarship that tells you things you don't like could actually be useful in creating a plan that we could deploy against a predatory state. That's serious. That's a very serious uh, piece. Um, man, that was wonderful. That was, it was uh, two hours. I was like, one hour. I, I, I know. And I was in yeah, and I, I I got other things to do. I have other things to do. <laughs> Look, go get the book, Textualizing Angela Davis, um, New Bones Abolition, Abolitionists with um, Erica Garner, I Pearl. Um, yeah, you've been you've been coming with some works. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, coming on the platform today. Uh, I know we had planned on doing this. We had planned on doing Like a for, month ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah month ago. I know, I mean, there's another discussion of March 5. So hopefully mm. your um, comrades in BPM will still want to talk to me. Um, but Of course they will. Everybody loves loves Dr. James and I'm I, sure they I, as well. That's not what I hear on the streets, but. <laughs> it's not my hear the street. <laughs> Oh, it's like, when do you go on the street? Oh, yeah, know. like we're, we're two outcasts. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate anyway. you. I appreciate your work as well. And I, I feel, I just want to be honest. Like, um, I've learned from Black Power Media, and I've definitely learned from FTP movement. And you know, there is a way that doing the academic grind, and yeah, I'm compensated for it. Um, can distract you from what you need to know on the ground. So I appreciate your sharing and all of y'all's collective teaching because it, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the academy, but I know it pays my bills and allows me to be a scholar. But I also would, you know, seek to be an advocate and also a supporter of organizing that, you know, can deal with wow, gee, what we're facing with right now. But we have ancestors, we have love, and we, you know, love not fear, as Mumia says. I got shout out to the crew over Mumia, yeah. who will be uh, 70 years old on April 24th. So definitely. Yay, Mumia. Yes, 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 yes. Definitely, um, again, appreciate, you know, um, your uh the kind words, we start with that, but also your work and understanding. Um, because oftentimes people think that I have a problem with the academy. I have a problem with everybody. I got a problem with myself. Oh, with everybody? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't I don't I don't discriminate. I start with myself first. But because you know, this is this is revolution and I feel like, you know, um, you know, it, it's not personal towards the academy. Um, you know, I could work with anyone as long as they're anti-oppression as long as they're on the right side of the barricades. You know, I'm not caught up in, you know, whether I like you or not, that has nothing to do with anything. Um, I'm, I'm clear about the difference between a comrade and a friend. We don't have to kick it. We don't have to hang together. Right. We don't have to like each other. We don't have to make any money together. None of that shit matters to me at the end of the day. 
at the end of the day, how are we going to move towards liberating our people? That's what it is to, to, the, to whatever extent you can. You I'm know. so glad you said that. And do you mind if I just read the last paragraph of the book since we started? Go ahead and knock it out. Yes. So this is a book and will end in this way. <clears throat> in the 1950s and 1960s, amidst the second civil war to resist black dishonor and death, a 15-year-old left her Southern Black family and culture to enroll in a private progressive Manhattan high school. There, she was introduced to and mesmerized by the Communist Manifesto. The Black girl memorized Marx and Engels' terse instruction that our endeavor is not to interpret the world, but to change it. A decade later, she would converse and align with global iconic revolutionaries and rebel intellectuals. Over five decades of civil and human rights advocacy, working within the context of elite academia, Hollywood, celebrity movement culture, publishing, media platforms, politicians, Angela Davis would both interpret and change the world. Hmm. That's a, a, a great way to close this um, piece. Um, I guess I'm yes, I enjoyed the book, and you know, like I said, I, I really want folks to uh, check it out and make a uh, in, informed decision. You know, one thing I, I appreciate about what you just finished talking about is um, doing the research. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not you know we we take things personal. We want to make everything about you know the personality yeah. or the individual or you know. If you don't like this person, then you must be a hater or you're disgruntled or whatever the case is. You know. Well, I I am disgruntled. But yeah, and I'm a hater. I I hate oh, bullshit. you're a hater? I didn't know that. I, 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 I hate so bullshit. Sad. It's so, <laughs> anyway, it's so sad to be a hater. Don't be a hater. It's but okay. Part of my job. But um, we're gonna we're gonna win in spite of ourselves. I want to dedicate uh tonight's show, um, or today's show to the sister. Yeah. Yes, yes, Ialua Ferguson, um, who made her transition. Um, Ialua and her husband, Baba Herman Ferguson, um, I had the opportunity to know them and learn from them and to, um, you know, be in that presence, be in that midst. Uh, in fact, Baba Herman Ferguson, her husband, who is now uh, an ancestor as well, he's in our film, Organizing is the New Cool. Uh, we interviewed him for that. But uh, I want to acknowledge Eloa Ferguson, um, whose services will take place on March 9th. Make sure you uh, support, don't have the uh, information on hand, but if you go to our social media, you can see ways to support uh, their family, so on and so forth. Here's a photo um, that we took some years ago. This is Eloa next to, yes, next to Seku, and we have, Sister Walia, who was, um, her father was a comrade of ours, part of Panther 21. Um, uh, oh my goodness. I'm, Is that Daruba with the sunglasses? Yeah, we got Daruba with the sunglasses. You have and that's you in the blue shirt. Yep. And you have Mama Pam Africa. You have, oh, uh, that's right. uh, our, our sister in Jenga, um, mm -hmm. who is a Panther out of Baltimore as well. Um, and in the middle, I couldn't think of her father's name. It's Ali, Ali Hassan Ali Bey. That's mm -hmm. his word along with us. And, um, you know, this is a piece that we did um, a few years ago in regards to a tribute for Veronza Bowers. So we mm -hmm. want to definitely uh, send our condolences and love to the family of Eloa Ferguson, who is a movement matriarch, now an ancestor. And we, uh, will continue to continue on anyway. Yeah, and Kalandria, I do want to say thank you. I mean, I'm maybe being repetitive for your work. And actually, this is the first interview I've done on this book. So I appreciate your right. having interest in it. I definitely appreciate you coming on to talk about it. And um, and, and you allowed me to ask the questions I wanted to ask. And I was saying, look, don't ask me. I'm just joking. But anyway, <laughs> we appreciate you coming on. We're checking out RSTV, Black Power Media, and we will be back soon. Matter of fact, I have another episode coming up right after this one. Be safe. Talk to you in a minute. RSTV.